so it's, it's what I described in my talk today. It's like this 985 features for each of the 10,000 words. And so you started with the standard features. I pared it down to these 985, yeah, actually. No, no, it's just I picked 985 words that I thought were important. It's actually like 985 most common words in English, more or less. Like all the words, yeah. yeah. OK, I think I uh, should actually start like running through this. OK, I think al almost everyone is actually at the point of having a thing that runs. So this, this notebook. Um, so if, if you're already here, like you're free to just step through this as you like, because it should be just straightforward and just run. But um, I can kind of walk through this at, at some kind of pace. Um, and yeah, yeah, we can see how it goes. So um, this, this is just basically running through the entire uh, analysis that I talked to you about this morning. Uh, so the first thing is going to be loading these semantic vectors for the words, so getting like the word embedding features. Um, hey, that didn't work. That's cool. Oh, maybe I should actually create the data directory, because I'm an idiot and haven't actually done these things. Hang on. Uh, all right, let me try that again. God damn it, are you kidding me? <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to get away with like not having the data appear 20 times. Uh, Son of a gun. <sighs> All right. All right. Um, have you guys, has anybody gotten to this point yet of like loading the, loading the word vectors? Does this? Some people got here? Okay, let's, let's forge ahead, yeah. Um, so we can look at a vector for just like one word. It looks like this. This is the vector for finger. This is the meaning of the word finger encoded in a great deal of data for whatever apparent reason that will become apparent in a moment. Um, it's use useless to actually look at, so let's not look at it. Uh, just kidding, let's actually plot it so we can see what it looks like. It's still useless to look at. Um, but the key thing, like I talked about this morning, so each of these nine, you know, this is a 985 dimensional vector for the word finger. Each of these dimensions uh, says something about its co occurrence with one of these 985 like, target words that I have. Um, this doesn't mean a lot on its own, maybe, but what we can do is we can compare words. So we're going to compare the vectors for finger, fingers plural, and language, which is a very different word. And when we do that, um, what you can see is that finger, which is in black, and fingers, which is in red, uh, are maybe much more similar to each other than either one is to language. And we can look at this another way, too. So if we look at, uh, did I, where did I pull these out? OK, whatever. We can look at the, the correlation coefficient between um, the vector for finger, which you can get in this English 1000 object, just, just index that with a string, and it'll give you back the vector, and the vector for fingers, and that's like 0 0.81, which is decent. Or we can do the same thing with the vector for language, and that's minus 0.18, that's like really low, right? 
Okay, so, so this is saying that like finger and fingers are very related to each other compared to finger and language. Completely sensible, like this algorithm would be an idiot to do otherwise. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, so we, we have this nice little function, find words like word. So what this is going to do is uh, we just run this and it'll spit out some words that have to do with finger. So this is just essentially going to take the correlation of the finger vector with all the 10,470 words in the set and then give you back the 10 top ones. Surprise, surprise, it has a correlation of one with the word finger. Um, fingers is 0.81 and then the other ones are obviously related. Uh, we can do this for another word, language, um, and it gives us things like languages and understanding for whatever reason, and philosophy and learning, which are kind of related to language, right? So you can play with this. You can try like any word you want to think of. Well, not really any word, but you know, any word that's in this set of 10,000 whatever. Um, let's see, like brain, is that in here? Yeah, it is. Brains, pain, hey, nice. <laughs> Conscious, cause, painful, mental. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, people don't talk about brains with like a lot of, uh, you know, positive, positive emotions. Okay. Um, that's funny. I didn't realize this was here. Okay. So um, this is uh, this little bit right here. This is this was Google's demo of word to vec showing that you can do like king minus man plus woman equals queen. Um, it turns out that this this actually it works okay. So it returns to you like king is still the first, but queen is the second thing. It's like the closest next thing. And that was the way that the people at Google actually did this test. It was like they'll throw away the first word. They'll throw away the word itself, like the original word in their in their testing. But it turns out that I think queen is still the most similar word to king, even if you don't do this minus man plus woman thing. Um, this is supposed to be like the vector analogy thing that I talked about this morning. That it's like there's a set of vectors that point from you know the words like king, prince, duke to the words like queen, princess, duchess. But whatever, you can play with that if you're interested in it. Uh, okay, so this is just like playing with word vectors, seeing what you can do with word vectors. Um, does anybody have any questions about word vectors or questions about any of these things? so far. I feel like this is pretty straightforward. This is well-worn territory. OK. OK. Let's go on. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is load up the stimuli. So um, here, uh, fortunate enough to have taken like a, lingu a linguistics class where you had to use prot. Anyone? Hey, you guys. OK, hey, what's up? Uh, so, anyone else? Any prodders? So, um, this is a, a piece of software that people use to like annotate uh, audio, usually transcript, uh, you know, audio of, of speech. Um, you can. We've done what's called forced alignment, which is where you take the audio and you take a transcript, you run it through this uh, forced alignment procedure, and tries to figure out exactly you know which moments every word is spoken. What's like at what millisecond does this word begin, and at what millisecond does this word end? Okay, so we have that's called an aligned transcript. Then it's stored in this file format called a text grid, uh, and that's what we're going to use to actually build our models. Because this is you know we have the audio that was played for our subjects, and we need we need to know exactly when every word was spoken in the in this audio, right? We're not actually gonna do that. We have the text grids here, so we're just gonna load those up. Um, we're also gonna load up some other crap metadata called TR files, but we can kind of ignore those. So in this code right here, if you run this, um, this is a set of stories that we're gonna use. These are the, the stories in our regression data set and the training data set. Um, they each have a name. These names are not really meaningful. It's just the names of the stories. Uh, and then there's one story in our prediction test data set. Uh, we're going to load up the, the text grids into this grids variable and the TR files, which just have other timing information in this TR files thing. Uh, and then there's one more step here. Um, we're going to convert these into another uh, sort of representational format that is just something that um, I built to, to deal with this data called a uh, data sequence. So let's run this sucker, and it should 
do nothing or not appear to do anything. All right, are we, are we all at this point? Yeah, okay. This is probably going pretty slow. So, um, so one of the stories is, is called Naked. Um, so we're gonna look at this story. Um, uh, the dot data thing here, this is uh, just a list of all the words, I think. And if we just look at the length of this, then okay, there are 3,218 words here. We can look at the first 100 words and they're this, and this is just someone who you know told a story. I think, yeah, this is a more readable version. I grew up in a really small town in Alabama, and my sister was and is to this day a remarkably beautiful woman, and I was always really good in school, so it fell into this pattern, blah, blah, blah. So this is like one of the stories that the subjects heard, right? Okay, uh, so this, this uh, uh, data sequence, it also has timing information. So if we look at data times, this variable, um, this is going to tell us the times at which the first 10 words were spoken. So I was spoken 0.197 seconds into the story. Gru was at 0.386 seconds into the story, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, this TR times, this is the time of the middle of each of our fMRI acquisitions. So the, the data, the fMRI data was collected like we had one acquisition every two seconds. Right. And the story started playing exactly 10 seconds into the, to the scan. Yes? Where are the timestamps for the words coming from? Uh, they're coming from this aligned transcript, right? So the, the text grid file has all this information about like exactly when every word is spoken. Is it the onset of the word? Uh, it is the onset. Uh, blah, blah, blah. I think this data times, this might actually be the middle of each word. The t this time corresponds to the middle of each word. Yeah, that's what it says here. Um, <laughs> There's basically, I took, uh, so the, the transcripts, the aligned transcript has the onset and offset time of each word. Um, and I'm assuming that sort of the moment of recognition or something occurs in the middle of the word. I don't know. This doesn't matter that much. It's fMRI, like 50 milliseconds here or there isn't gonna kill us, right? Yeah, I use something called the P2FA, which is the UPenn forced aligner. Uh, yeah, uh, P2FA. Um, let's see, I think I actually have a better fork of it here somewhere. Uh, P2FA, yeah. So this is what we use. It works quite well. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's go back to this. So, um, right, so these are the times of each TR. Right, so the scan started 10 seconds before, you know, the, the story starts at exactly 10 seconds into the scan. Uh, and these are the middle times of each TR. So there was one TR that was nine seconds before the, you know, the onset of the, the story uh, up to whatever. These are just every two seconds, right, roughly. Um, and this function is useful for like debugging stuff, but not actually that interesting. But this tells us like the, it's gonna give us an array of the words that occurred sort of during each TR, right? So we're gonna have a few blank TRs at the beginning, there should be five, and then I grew up in a really small town in Alabama, is all like during one TR, and then, and my sister is in one TR, was and is to this day remarkably, is another TR, et cetera. So this is just like chunking the, the words by like where they occurred in the scan. This is not actually um, how we're going to end up projecting them into the space, but it's close enough that it you know, gives you a sense of what's happening. So um, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna convert these lists of words into lists of these 985 dimensional vectors. Okay, so this, this thing right here, um, this project stimuli block, this does that. So now we have these things called semantic seeks, seeks uh, that has the, um, the stuff that's happening in each story. So uh, let's look at one of these. This is for that same story, Naked. Um, we're going to see the size of the data object, which should be number of words, words 985. And then we can look at the, yeah. So it's going to be 3,218 by 985. And then this is just printing the first 10 words. So we have like 10 985 length vectors. Fine. OK. So this is going to be like the input to our regression. It, not quite. One more step before we get to the input to the regression. So um, this is actually 
Yeah, where we go, so, so the issue now is that we kind of, um, we have some information for each word, but the words are occurring at sort of, you know, random intervals, like sometimes they happen really quickly, sometimes they happen kind of slowly, sometimes there are long gaps, sometimes there are short gaps. How do we get this all into the same time scale as the fMRI data so that we can do the regression that we want to do, right? So um, I wrapped this up in, there's this function you're going to call called chunk sums that is uh, actually not going to just sum over each chunk, but it's going to do something slightly clever where it uses a, a, what's called a um, um. Lanzos filter to downsample the data to the same rate as the fMRI acquisition. So let's run this, and this might take a few seconds to run. That was pretty quick. I don't know. Okay, so um, now we have these downsampled semantic seeks. And I think if we look at the size of one of those, like the thing that was above, so downsampled semantic seeks, if we look at naked, there's a shape. Uh, oh, it just, this is, these are just now vectors. So now, instead of being 3,218, uh, this is 437, which is the number of TRs in the, that scan. Yeah. So is it critical for this method that the word appears multiple times so that essentially those time points are maximally distinct from one another? So I'm trying to think about how this maps onto how I think about modeling trials in fMRI, right? Like I would want, ideally, like repetitions of a trial, or if I'm going to have a single trial, then I have to think about how to make that maximally linear and everything else, or, yeah, not linear and yeah, yeah. everything else, so that I can estimate that. So it seems like here, if they had just heard, like, one word once, that it wouldn't be sufficient to model the data for that word. If we were treating each word as, like, an independent feature, then that would be entirely true, but we're not, right? So we converted each word into one of these vectors, these 985 dimensional vectors. Right? So every word is like a list of 985 like floating point numbers between minus 5 and 5. So every one of those features occurs. That's the key thing. Into this feature space where everything happens all the time, kind of. So, so each time the word team appears, or the word team appears, or the word king appears. A bunch of those features are going to be on at the same time. So even if the word king has never appeared, we can still predict what the response is going to look like to King based on the features that are present. If we know what the features of that word are, then we can predict what the, what the response should look like. That's that's the point of like using these uh, the semantic features. Yeah. Uh, with the smooth relationship between different voxels, or. Yeah, like so there's like this, so what she was asking about, and also right now you're, you're doing some sort of smoothing. And this, this is all temporal, and so far this is all just on the stimulus side. We'll get there at the end, I promise you. Uh, there's one thing that is, um, so I mean, we haven't touched the response data here yet. Uh, this is purely like we are, we're filtering things temporally to get them at the same time scale as the fMRI so that we can fit the models. I, I mean, there's certainly, you know, this is fMRI, it's mushy, we're, it's we disentangle responses to a bunch of words that come quickly. If we have enough stimuli, then that should help to disentangle this. Like the more stimuli we have, the more disentangled it should be. The thing that I'm not making clear here is, um, so remember the way that I talked about this, this morning was uh, we had this prior on like which words are related to each other. Incorporate that into our regression. Uh, it turns out that that is exactly equivalent we're going to do here mathematically, and I can talk about that if you guys want, but there's this really interesting equivalence between we're going to do ridge regression in features that we've projected our words into, and that's equivalent to doing this, which is establishing a uh, but regression with the original, you know, words, and then we have some priors on these words are related. So, um, yeah, yeah. But okay, so, so now we're, we're almost ready to actually do the regression. So we have, like, for each story, we've gone from a list of words to, uh, like, vectors, like one vector for each word that we just looked up our, our big vector space, and we know what those vectors kind of look like. Uh, and now we've downsampled those vectors so that they appear, like, at the same time scale as the fMRI. 
I think there's one more stage here. We're going to look at sort of what that looks like. So if we run this next box, this actually plots the, uh, please, please plot it. There we go. OK. So this is actually showing um, sort of what it looks like for one feature over time. OK, so this is for, I think this is still the story. Naked, yeah, OK. Um, so we're looking at the first 60 seconds of this story. Uh, each of these little stems is a word, right? So there's a bunch of words that happen in these first 60 seconds. You can see that the words are, you know, they're sort of irregularly spaced, as words are when we speak. Right? Sometimes there's a bunch of words that can be clumped, and then we'll get much more words in a really, really, really tight little clump here, and then there's, you know, some more. Whatever. But the, the height or the, the sort of y-axis here is the value of one feature. I don't remember what feature we're using. It's some random feature. It's the co-occurrence of each word with some, uh, yeah, I don't remember. This is like the, yeah, feature two, the third feature out of all these. Doesn't really matter. Um, the important thing would be now look at the relationship between the black um, stem and the red plot here. So the red line is our downsampled version of this black, uh, of the per word data. So that's when we take the per word data and we downsample it to the rate of the fMRI, which is we have one of these red dots every two seconds. Uh, this is what our data looks like, right? Is the words that are clumpy, within those together? Yes, yes. Can you recover what the individual words is later, or is that lost? You actually can. So you can go from uh, from this red line back to so you can't find the times of the of the words, but you can recover exactly which words went into each thing. Uh, not like after regression, and we can't do decoding yet. Like that's hard. But um, just going from like this representation back to the original one, that's totally possible. Um, it's like a non-negative least squares recovers precisely which words were in it. It's almost weird how well that works. Uh, so information is like not really lost there because there's still like a finite set of words and they can only come together, whatever, so many ways. The exact time it gets lost. Yeah, yeah. They kind of get munched together. It's like, what's the local topic? Kind of, what's the local semantic vector look like? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's like, it's whatever this word is, yeah, it's not very correlated, except at two points here. So like around here and around here, they say some words that are related to this feature. Yeah. All right. It's yellow? Uh, no, that's the words, that's the 10,000, not the 985. Uh, if you sort the words along the second feature, then you might find out what it is. Whatever the highest there is probably what that word is. But okay, so this is to illustrate like what we've done going from words to vectors, this downsampled thing that's like our actual fMRI-like data. Okay, this is, yeah, yeah, this is gonna be one of the regressors that we use, almost. We have one more step. Uh, but like this sequence of transformations, this took like a really long time to get to. This this was like a lot of the magic of making this work was just figuring out how to do all of this stuff correctly. Uh, and it turns out that a lot of the solutions here are just like signal processing. What is sig you know what are the standard signal processing methods tell you about doing this kind of stuff? Like you you want to do this without losing information? How do you do that? You use like an anti-aliasing filter to whatever. It's it's pretty um, stock signal processing techniques. What's the name of the design It's a Lantos filter, which I, I literally just found by like researching anti-aliasing filters on Wikipedia, and it's like this is. It's like okay, I'll I'll do that. Um, I tried some other things, and whatever, it's fine. Okay, so um, the next thing we're gonna do is just jam. You know, so we we now have one of these matrices for each of the stories. This we're just going to concatenate all those, and we're going to z-score them. Uh, blah, blah, blah. This tells us how long each of the stories is. 
fine. Uh, and then this is the final shape of our like stimulus matrix is going to be 3737 by 985 for our training data and 291 by 985 for our test data. All right. All right. We're just like es essentially just jamming all the stories together as if they were back, even though they were played. Each one played like a uh, run and they were played over questions. We can visualize this. So this is 10 features over the first 750 uh, volumes. They bounce around, some stuff happens, I don't know. This, this is just like, what, what, are the, what are the regressions? I'm gonna go to our model in a second. Okay, now comes the finite impulse response stuff. So I, I wrote out some stuff here. There's some links to like background information if you wanna learn about this. Uh, everybody knows about hemodynamic response functions, right? More, that, that's never a question you actually get an answer to if you ask that in like a classroom. Like everybody knows blah and people are like, yeah, yeah whatever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I think like most of us here are fMRI people. Uh, is anybody like not an fMRI person really? Okay, there's some not fMRI people, right? Uh, of course, yeah, thank you, Matt. Um, so <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> you're, you're an actual neuroscientist un unlike the rest of us. Um, <laughs> So, you know, when, there, when there's a maybe impulse of like, neural activity, we see the, the old signal changes this like reasonably characteristic manner uh, over a period of 10 to whatever seconds. Um, not actually that characteristic because uh, it, it varies a lot depending on the proximity of the tissue that you're studying to musculature. So, like, how close it is to the arteries that are supplying blood. How close Vein draining blood, these things like critically affect the shape of the HRF. Uh, for instance, like um, A1, uh, like primary auditory cortex, actually has HRFs that uh, peak usually around like two to three seconds, like this. Whereas the the standard like what is the canonical HRF? It's this after V1, which is where people have studied the hell out of you know HRFs in the early days, and they're like this obviously is how it is every. Like that must just be universal, but it's definitely not. Um, so we're not going to take this as a given. Instead, we're going to do this this finite impulse response uh, model that I talked about this morning. So what this is, uh, you're not actually going to do anything that it's complicated or looks like anything. You're just going to run this little function called make delayed that is going to do this for you. But the net effect is that it's going to we're going to we create a set of delays um, and print them out here, one, two, three, four. And uh, now we've made delayed versions of these stimulus matrices. So like I talked about this morning, so um, these are the delays that we're going to use. So we're going to say that like the, the if I write like here-ish, can you guys see over there? OK. You so we have the delay for two, four. That looks like shock. Eh, that's fine. So we're going to say that our response at time it is going to be a function of our um, stimulus at time uh, at these four delays. So like t minus 1, stimulus at time t minus 2, stimulus at time t minus 3, and stimulus at time t minus 4. Okay. Uh, it's going to be a linear function of these things, so we're fitting like weights on all these, but, but this is essentially our, our model. Uh, what these like one, two, three, four mean, these are delays that are in TRs, right? So this is each of these is like a two second delay. So essentially we have this curve here that's our, that's our HRF, right? So uh, if I redraw something that looks like this HRF, we have yeah, and this is like maybe five seconds, and this is maybe, I don't know, 10 seconds over here. Um, so we're gonna approximate this nice, smooth, lovely curve by four points that are at um, two, four, six, and eight. OK? So this is what we're doing in the FR model, is instead of fitting this entire curve, we're just saying it's non-zero at these points. In fact, it's essentially we're, we're approximating it by you know, something like this, um, and then zero everywhere else. Okay, by any delay that we don't include, we're just saying like 
it's definitely zero. Like the weights for that delay are definitely zero. It's equivalent to just spinning a model where those weights are set to exactly zero. Is there a particular reason you chose four uh, time flex as opposed to more? Uh, so this was mostly by like playing around with the data and seeing what works. Um, in I, I based a lot of this on work from a colleague of mine, Shinji Nishimoto, who did a lot of work with like movie data and movie and fMRI data. And he always used three delays, like two, three, and four TRs, but that was in visual cortex, where you get longer HRFs. In the auditory system, you have shorter HRFs. So I included an extra, this one delay, which made model performance better. There, there's like some, you know, inverted U-shaped curve in like the number of delays you include and in performance. If you include too many, then you, have way too many features and the regression falls apart, and if you include too few, then you're throwing out real information. Right? So it's a question of like actually how close are these other points to zero? Uh, yeah. Close enough. So if you had a TR of one, would you put eight in? Uh, yes. You would have to use more in that case. Things get weird when you get very short TRs. Um, like so because we're using four delays here, right? We had 985 features originally. Now we're going to have 985 times four features, which is like 3,940 features. It's a lot, it's a lot of features, right? It's more features than we have time points. That's fine, it's fine, it's cool. Uh, but if we had eight, then that would be like, whatever, 7,800 bajillion. A lot of features, right? Uh, and that, that gets rowdy. So um, one thing that you can do instead is uh, actually use an HRF basis, which um, seems to work quite well. So this is something that people also use in like SPM worlds. Uh, so you can say like, I assume that, so essentially, I mean, what we're doing here is we have uh, four basis functions that you know, one of them looks like this, one of them looks like this, one of them looks like this, one of them looks like this. They're just like each delta functions. We can say instead, you know, I think my HRF is composed of bases, you know, one of them looks like this, one of them looks like this, and one of them looks like this. I don't know. There's some standard basis sets that people use. Uh, each of these is, you know, uh, 15 seconds long. Uh, and then I can compose, I assume that all HRFs can be composed out of these bases. That turns out to work uh, even slightly better than this. In some situations, this is just the easier thing to explain, I think. Um, but this is probably what you'd want to do if you have a higher or a shorter TR. Because then you can use you know, only three things instead of blowing it out to eight, and it even gives you better performance. Yeah. So I'm actually wondering, so you said that the, the peak uh, of the HR in auditory cortex, for example, is like two seconds. So if you have a two second TR, you're, you're using four of these. I'm actually wondering if you're undersizing the, the like certain HRFs if, if they're really fast. Uh, I, I mean, that's... Uh, Probably not. So the, the bold response, um, the frequency, like, the frequency content, like the actual signal frequency content of the bold response, uh, it doesn't go higher than about 0.3 hertz, which is, corresponds to a TR of about 1.5. So faster than that, there is nothing. There is no bold response. Like not, the blood just can't change, bold can't change faster than that in any meaningful way. You're at half hertz with your TR. Uh, yeah, yeah, which corresponds to like a 0.25 hertz right. Nyquist's yeah, limit. Yeah. Uh, so we're, we're like, it's four lines. Yeah, we're, we're about right. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think I think you can go actually a little bit faster, and it's and it's okay. Um, but yeah, there's there's. I mean, if things are way faster, then then you know, bold is not the right method to. <laughs> okay. Any more questions before we? Proceed. Cool. All right. Um, let's look at these things. Yeah, they're now 37, 37 by 39, 40, and 291 by 39, 40. Boom, boom. Uh, we can visualize these. This is just plotting, you know, one feature at each of the four delays, uh, and you can see that these are all. This is exactly the same time time course, but each shifted by one time point. All right. So we just did this like copy and delay operation to, uh, to get our full design matrix. All right, now we're going to load the actual fMRI data. Uh, so now we have ZPRESP and Z, or ZRRESP and ZPRESP and this mask variable, if we look at the shapes of them. So for ZRRESP, we have 3737 time points by 37,000 voxels. All right, this is our training data set. For the, for the 
prediction, the test data set, we have 491 time points by 37,000 voxels. Uh, the mask is just a, a binary mask showing us like which voxels out of our scan window we actually used. Does this make sense? Does anybody have questions at this point? I think this should be straightforward. Uh, we can visualize what the mask looks like for whatever reason. We picked out like cortical voxels and that's what we're showing here. Um, whole, whatever, it's stupid, I don't care. Um, let's look at the responses of some voxels because I think this is important. So this is six voxels that I obviously selected for some reason, but I don't remember why. Um, each of these, you know, there's just some pattern of response over time, right? They, they look kind of similar, but whatever. This is just to, to look at like what the what the data looks like that we're gonna be regressing here, right? So this is like the data that I was showing you this morning. All right, now let's fit the regression model. This is where the actual magic happens. So um, this this text here is describing model uh, ridge regression. Uh, Someone turn on the or whatever. I don't know. Was me? Did I do a thing? All right, whatever. Hey, thanks. All right. Um, okay, so we're gonna do ridge regression. So ridge regression. Um, let me give you like the fastest possible version of this. Uh, who has heard of ridge regression or like done ridge regression before? <laughs> Whatever. Um, so a reasonable number of you. Okay. Stay on lights. So uh, the idea behind um, so our, our regression model is always going to be this form, like y equals x beta, right? So y is our uh, like response variable. X is our Stimulus matrix, beta is the weights that we fit. Y in this case is going to be like a, a, a let's see, T by let's call it M matrix, where T is the number of time points and M, as in Mancy, is the number of voxels. X is going to be a T by P matrix, where P is the number of features. And beta is going to be a P by M matrix. Okay? Now the um, the way that if you just want to do regression, like the standard way that people write out linear regression, is you want to find the beta, uh, let's call it beta hat, that minimizes uh, this function that's going to be um, uh, essentially the sum of squared error, which is going to be like y minus x beta. So this is, I'm using like a L2 norm notation, but this is just the sum of the squared errors. That's all this is. You take y minus x beta, every element in that matrix, just square them, add them up. That's this term. So if we just did this, this gives us ordinary least squares regression. This is like when you learned about regression in high school, if you did that, this is what you were doing. This is standard like backslash regression in MATLAB. If you're a MATLAB, whatever, heretic, uh, but this has problems if we just do ordinary least squares regression. You can overfit very easily. You can, if you have more uh, features than you have data points, you can almost always fit your data precisely. You can get to, so there's zero error, which is completely pointless because you're 100% like just introducing tons of crap and noise into your, into your model. So we want to do something to encourage the model to be better. Right? We want it to like lift itself up. Uh, and the way we're going to do that is to put constraints on what the weights can be. We're going to penalize the model for setting kind of arbitrary weights. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to add a penalty to this, where we're going to say, uh, I use alpha here, is that right? OK. Uh, alpha squared, squared. Uh, times. Uh, this, okay? So this is just the sum of squares of beta. Every element in beta, square it, add them all up. Uh, we're gonna add this to this cost function, right? So now um, we're finding the beta that not just minimizes this thing, which is called the, um, this is the loss. Uh, 
but we're minimizing the sum of the loss and this term, which is the penalty. Okay. Uh, now what this means is that the betas can't get too big, right? If you get a really big beta, then it's like that's penalized a lot. So if you can get away like with having a, a smaller beta, it'll be like, okay, let's, let's just use a smaller beta because big betas cost a lot to this model. Um, it also means that uh, the way that the model deals with covariances in the betas is, uh, or covariances in the x's is different. If you do ordinary least squares regression, then you're trying to exactly pull apart every regressor from every other one, like completely decorrelate them during the regression procedure, which sometimes things are really correlated and sometimes that's hard to do. Uh, but if we constrain what the betas can be, then it doesn't allow things to be completely decorrelated. It says, okay, they, they only need to be like mostly decorrelated and that's, and that's fine. Yeah. Do you use the same hyperparameter value for all feature spaces? Like if you're working with phonetic features does it work for the same Absolutely not, no. And uh, so what we're gonna do is we're actually going to estimate the alpha in this regression procedure that we're gonna do here. Um, that's an excellent, we have like a whole paper on exactly that question. Like two papers, it's, it's beautiful, yeah. Um, so you definitely want to use like different hyperparameters for different feature spaces, but that gets really interesting if you want to fit one model that combines multiple feature spaces. Can you still use different hyperparameters for them? It turns out there was no good method for doing this, so we have a new method that we call banded regression that is doing exactly that. Uh, but yeah, it gets, it gets squeaky, it's fun. Yeah. So aside from like the computational, if cost is reducing your input, uh, it actually doesn't work better doesn't for this model. It, yeah, um, and also it's absurdly more expensive. Yeah. Like we're gonna be able to fit these models in a few minutes on our laptops and fitting L1 models to all this data would take like a day or two on the cluster, right? It's, it's absurd because you have to fit each voxel right. individually and all at the same time, yeah. So, oh, sorry, that was about that step. So, so this is per voxel instance? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're gonna, we're fitting a separate set of betas per voxel, right? This beta matrix is P by M. So we have one you know, length P vector for each of the M voxels. Uh, it turns out with ridge regression, which is what we're doing here, uh, that there's a lot of uh, uh, redundancy in the computation of uh, you know, the weights for one voxel and the weights for another voxel. So a lot of that can be shared and then you just go. So um, it's very cheap to do regression on all voxels simultaneously. And so what you're saying about L1? So with L1, the, there's no redundancy between different voxels. So you essentially have to restart the entire regression procedure for every voxel. Uh, whereas here, like 90% of the work is actually shared. Uh, even though we're fitting totally independent vox models for each voxel, each one doesn't influence the other ones. It's just like the computational work of fitting the models is shared in, in ridge regression and it's not in L1 regression. Yeah. Uh, so we can choose to do that or not do that. Um, in this case, uh, what do I set the default to? Yeah, so in this case, we're gonna set the hyperparameter to be the same for everyone, um, but that's just because it makes it a little bit faster to estimate. Uh, we can choose a different hyperparameter for each one. Uh, that works better in general because, you know, it, it's actually kind of an interesting question too. And this is, this is, I think, really key to this, you know, a lot of doing this gets into this regression stuff. Um, so if you choose the same hyperparameter for everyone, then um, it's like you're adding a little bit of extra regularization. And what that tends to do is it makes the, the very best voxels work slightly worse because you know, they are able to choose a really good hyperparameter on their own. But the voxels that are kind of intermediate or bad, uh, they tend to get better when you choose the same hyperparameter for everyone. Uh, and that's because they're, you know, they're Estimates would be noisy. Your estimate of the hyperparameter for that uh, for that thing would be noisy. Um, in the end, like the the truth is that you know. So the way we're going to choose the hyperparameter hyperparameter is by random uh, subsets of the data. So we're doing cross validation where we choose a random subset of our training data, train on the rest of it, test on our subset. Um, if you just do that more times, uh, so if you do that 50 times or 100 times, then doing individual hyperparameters per voxel is almost always better. Uh, like, it just takes a lot more time, All right? So here I, I wanted to do something that would fit quickly, so we're gonna do the same across everyone. But yeah, that's a good question, yeah. So I'm trying to think about where the FIR is coming into play in the ridge regression. So yes. we're not actually 
specifying anything there about the HRF, right? Like that's what we're trying to fit. That's, that's the beautiful thing about the FIR is that we, we don't have to change how we do the regression one bit. Okay. It's just, it's implicit in this regression. So what happened is our X matrix here, uh, this matrix is actually, uh, So we had our, our original x, which was, uh, let's say it's n by, um, let's call it p tick, whatever. Uh, and then this is x tick is this. And then we made this into our real x, which is uh, now going to be a, a bigger matrix. It's like n by p equals, in this case, 4 times p prime, p dash, p tick, whatever. Uh, where we have uh, whatever these four blocks, and let's say the first one is going to be like this, and these are all going to be zeros. And the next one is going to have this, and these are going to be zeros. Yeah, so these are just like the different shifted versions of the, you know, so this is, this was x prime, right? So this is x prime, this is x prime, this is x prime, and then we have. One. So the shape of your X matrix just changes to account for the fact that instead of modeling time with one feature, we're modeling time shift four time points that are shifted. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So it's all just implicit in here. That's that's the beautiful thing about the our like inseparable time inseparable model. Uh, we don't have to change anything. The betas we just learn a separate beta for each of these sets of features, and it's fine. Uh, it's kind of weird. It's using a lot of parameters, but. It's cheap to do and it works well. So, all right. Okay. So um, let's just run this because this is going to take a minute to to run. I think. Um, ooh, no. It says nboots one. Stop. Stop. No. Don't do that. Uh, okay. It's going to shoot for a minute. Uh, that might be fine. Whatever. I wanted to describe the cross-validation thing because I think that's actually kind of important. So um, I mentioned this briefly a moment ago. I'm going to set this to like five and just see what happens. You guys don't have to do that. You can run it for one if you are not feeling like your computer can hang with the whatever heavy metal stuff. Uh, so what this is doing is um, it's going to be taking the, uh, the X and Y for our training data set. Uh, randomly breaking them into chunks. Um, it randomly breaks them into 40 chunks. Or, sorry, not randomly. It just breaks them into 40 sequential chunks. And then, it, uh, no. It's a lie. It breaks them into chunks that are 40 TRs long. So we had 37, 37 uh, time points. We're going to break that into 40 TR chunks. And then we're going to take 20 of those chunks randomly selected. And that's going to form our, like, cross-validation set, OK? Uh, the model's going to train on the other data, so the data that we didn't, you know, not those 20 chunks, but all the other ones. Uh, so it's going to fit the, the regression parameters, whatever. It's going to test them on that held out data, the, the 800 TRs that we've pulled out. Um, and it'll do that for each of our different alpha values. So we're testing, I think, 10 different alpha values that are log spaced between 10 and 1,000. I wish this would show me what it's doing. Am I missing something? Uh, I do have the basic config. OK, I do. All right, it's just taking time. That's fine. No, no. Uh, yeah. So um, we'll see. We should see some diagnostic that's like printed out as this goes. Eventually. Uh, yeah. yeah. How extensive is your search to the chunking size? So the, the chunking size. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you'll, you'll see that. We'll see that. We're gonna do that um, in a moment. Um, so the chunking size, the reason that I do this chunking instead of like choosing random TRs is because you get this massive correlation induced by fMRI being blobby over time, right? So if you choose random TRs, then you're training on data that is like fundamentally correlated with the data that you're, that you're validating on, and that's bogus. And if you do that, it's going to lead you to like under, um, 
uh, underestimate the alpha that you need. Uh, so basically, the chunk length, it just needs to be longer than the sort of fundamental autocorrelation of the bold signal. Uh, I found that actually chunk lengths longer than five tend to work fine. Uh, that, so that's like 10 seconds, right? That's like the length of the HRF. That's about as long as you need. Like things that are outside of that don't really influence each other. Um, We've, we've talked about that. It tends to not actually matter. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's some nice theory about like autoregressive processes. And if you, you know, do chunk resampling of them with some length, then it's like you're approximating them with an autoregressive process that has like a parameter that's like raised to the power of whatever. I don't know. Yeah, there's, there's theory around this, but, but I think just like longer than sort of HRF is what you need. Uh, the amount that you hold out. Um, and the number of things that you do are related. Uh, so in general, you want to, you don't want to hold too much out because then you're training on too little and then you're going to overestimate your alpha. You don't want to hold too little out because then it's going to take you many, many, many resamplings to do it. So there's just some like, it's kind of a, a benefit thing. Uh, yeah, I think this is not actually printing the, the, uh, Diagnostics, which is annoying. Are, are you guys getting this so that it's actually printing things as it goes that are like, yeah. okay. This will take a moment. We can watch my CPU usage. It'll bounce up and down for everything. Uh, so, you're, you're yeah. Doing the, the on the chunks. It's not actually bootstrap. It's like random subsampling. Uh, it's a slight yeah. misnomer. Yeah. 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 Are you training from timeframes that are both? in the same run as one another and across from? Yes. So why are you not, like typically, right, like I always think about not mixing within and between runs. So why mm -hmm. in this case is that not overinflating? Uh, like why is that not leading to like overestimates of whatever? That's, that's fair. Um, I just haven't really played with it with like, uh, excluding single stories. So we could do like k-fold, like tenfold cross-validation, exclude like one run at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, in the end, we're going to test on a story that's a totally separate run. Uh, so like that test is not going to be affected by this, but that's that's a fair Yeah, point. like I would think uh, that that would make your classification worse, right? Because essentially you've trained something that has higher temple, like higher mm -hmm. autocorrelation than maybe you're actually going to Try to, that's that's possible. So okay. that would lead us to like underestimate the uh, yeah. parameter, yeah. right? That's that's possible. I I've looked at this a little bit, and it tends to be that the alpha parameter that we get from this. If you run enough of these resamplings, it, it's you can look at actually what the you know the alpha curve looks like for the test data. So like on the test data, what does our performance look like? And that tends to be very close to this. So I think we're we're in the right ballpark of things. We're not like vastly. Uh, underestimating, but that, that's a totally concern. That's I mean that's the point behind this chunking. So at least like with chunk length of forty, it's like we're using data that is you know on average within like it's about forty seconds away from from other data. So it's not like tightly correlated. Yeah, and I guess the, if anything, you're working against yourself, right? Like you're not. It's, it's only going to hurt the hurt. the test performance yeah. in the end. Yeah, there's nothing we can do to cheat here as long as we don't actually yeah. use that data to like influence what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any other questions while this is running? <gasps> and it still didn't print out our diagnostics. Come on. Come on. Okay. Uh, the next thing that we're going to do here. Hey, oh, so you guys got the diagnostics, right? That were like, uh, there's like for each um, resample, it gives you like for each alpha that it tries, it's like it's this good, this good, this good, this good, this good, and then it tries another one, and then blah 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 blah. Yeah. So the 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 ridge um, the ridge regression, there's like cool uh, uh, efficiencies that you can exploit within ridge regression. So the way that we solve ridge regression, there's like one like matrix factorization that happens first, and then to test different alphas, you're just doing matrix multiplications. So there's this very like cheap operation to test different alphas. So it's like really cheap to test many alphas, but expensive to like sample a new data set. Um, and there's other efficiencies that 
we exploit, I think, extremely cleverly in this rich code that I'm very proud of, but I'm not going to brag anymore. OK, so um, if you guys have gotten to this point right here, this curve is showing you, uh, on average, so this BS cores variable, this is the, the um, if we look at the size of this, uh, so it's 10 by 37 to 37226 by 5. Uh, so 10 is the number of alphas that we did. This is the number of voxels. And this is the number of uh, cross-validation ones. Um, so we're averaging across voxels and cross-validation ones here. So we're taking dot mean 2, dot mean 1. And then this is plotting our alphas. Uh, so this is showing for each alpha what was the mean correlation across all voxels uh, and across our 10 uh, or five uh, correlation folds. Um, so this is a very nice, like this is our alpha path that you were asking about. This is what it should look like. Um, if you do this kind of thing a lot, you'll see a lot of things that don't look like this. Uh, which is not ideal. Sometimes you'll see they just go up and then flatten it out. That sucks. Sometimes you'll see they start flat and then go down. That sucks. There's a lot of ways for this to fail, but if it works, it should look something like this. If we continue this out, the way that these pads almost always, always look, um, especially because we're using correlation, is uh, they're going to look like this. So when the alpha is way too small, it's going to have some value, and it is not really going to depend very much on the alpha because we're log spacing here. So when the alphas are very small, it doesn't really care. When the alpha is way too big, it doesn't really matter what the alpha is. And there's some kind of like critical regime right here where you get this bump and then some peak, and it comes down. Yeah. So this is generally what things should look like. If you don't see something like this, or if you see something that is all flat or like only looks like one part of this, then you're choosing the range of alphas incorrectly, and you should uh, try to fix that. Uh, the reason is that what we're looking at here is correlation. Okay, so we're testing uh, the performance metric that we're using is correlation. So correlation doesn't care. So one thing that happens as you um, as you increase the alpha here, you might think the beta is just go to zero, right? Like as our alpha gets very big, the beta is getting crushed down to almost exactly zero. Uh, but if you're computing correlations as your prediction metric, that doesn't matter. Right, because your I mean, your predictions could be ten to the minus sixth times whatever. As long as the shape of them is right, uh, you're fine. Right, because correlation is is like a scale invariant. Um, so with correlation, you get the shape where it's like flat, bump, flat. With uh, if you use R squared or just like squared error as your metric, this part stays, stays the same. So it's like flat bump, and then instead of going flat here, it goes to. Uh, that's not always true. It's not always flat over here. Sometimes it actually. Yeah, with R squared, you get something that goes from like negative infinity over here, maybe. And then you get this bump, and then it goes to zero. So this is zero. Right here. It goes to like exactly zero. Because if you're predicting with all zeros, you're predicting nothing, and your performance is zero. OK, so this is good. This means things are working well. Uh, this value of 0.05 doesn't mean anything to you. Um, this is like average correlation across a ton of voxels. That is actually pretty good for some of these things. Uh, let's look at the sizes of these variables. We already looked at BS cores. Um, the weights are the ones we're interested in. And core here, so this is actually the, the predicted performance on the held out data set. So that, that was already done by this function as well. Uh, we gave it the, the held out like prediction data set, and it you know, went through and predicted it with our, uh, with our weights that we did. Um, oh, right, so I guess I should say that this actually, this code, it already shows the alpha as this one, which is like 100 and 231, maybe, I don't know, whatever, something. Um, so it shows the alpha that was like, this is the best alpha on average, and then use that to, to the regression models on the whole set that we get out. You've tried it in various and found, I mean, I I mean, there's a, there's a range. I think it mostly depends on like the norm of the design matrix, like some norm of the design matrix. I'm not totally sure. 
uh, there, there tends to be like a, a reasonable range for the things that I do, which tends to be between like 10 and 10,000 ish. Uh, I, I would go higher if I was doing individual voxels because there are some voxels that like really, you know, they're very noisy and want more regularization, but usually not lower than 10. Like that's very rare. It's, it's a first pass thing. It's useful for other things too. If you want to do statistics across the voxels, like the PCA and stuff, then I would also do this because it ensures that all the voxels, sort of the weights have the same scale and et cetera. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's actually do the prediction. Okay, I guess we can we can do this. So um, this ZPREF, this is our, our responses to the prediction data set. It's 291 by number of voxels. Our weights are 340 by 37,000. Our this is our delayed p stim. This is the prediction data set stimuli 291 by 3940, which is the number of features. So let's just take the dot product of our stimulus and our weights. But bang, but boom, we get the the predictions. They look like this. Yeah. Okay. Um, now we can look, let's just look at one voxel. Uh, I don't know if this is actually is a decent voxel. So in black is the actual time course, which is z squared across time, and in red is the prediction time course. Uh, this doesn't look like it's super good, but if we z score the prediction as well, just to make the, the scale comparable, you can see that this is actually doing a pretty good job at predicting what this voxel is going to do. In this held out story. Right. Uh, the correlation between these two is. 0.59, that's, that's solid. That is probably among the better, maybe one of the best voxels in this data set. I'm sure I picked it because it was one of those and it looks pretty good. Um, it's rare to get like very high correlations on this data um, because my data sucks. Uh, but yeah, so um, the, the validation data set here is like, it's actually one story that's played twice and then we average the responses to those two. Two is like the minimum number that you need to do some other fancy statistic stuff like figuring out the noise ceiling. Uh, I didn't want to do more because you get probably weird repetition effects when you listen to the same story over and over. It's very predictable. When we did stuff in the past with like vision, vision data, um, we would play the same movie 10 times. Is that a validation set? And then you get much higher correlations uh, uh, in your you know, final test because your data is less noisy. You know, that average across 10 reps is much less noisy. But 0.59 is about it's in the ballpark of how good we get with uh, two, two repetition data. So let's compute the correlation for every one of the voxels. So there we go. Are you guys following along? Okay, okay. And then um, we can look at the histogram of these. So um, I've gotten very used to looking at these histograms, but they're not always the most obvious thing. Do I? So um, if this data was random, if this data was like, you know, if our predictions were just like random Gaussian variables that we, you know, np.random.randn, whatever, uh, what do you guys think this, this histogram should look like? Yeah, centered at zero. Symmetric. Symmetric. Uh, Almost Gaussian. It's actually uh, there. There is actually a theoretical answer for this for like correlation between random Gaussian variables, which is like a, it's a beta distribution, whatever. Um, but yeah, it should be symmetric, centered at zero, and and whatever. You can see that this is not symmetric. Uh, it's centered. I think the mode is still around zero. Uh, I don't know where is this. Slightly above zero. That's that's fine. Uh, and the left shoulder is like much smaller than the right shoulder, right? So um, there's a lot of the voxels out here. You know, there's there's a lot of crap voxels, of course. There are a lot of voxels that don't care about the stimulus. So, I mean, I call them crap voxels, but they're actually probably really useful for other things like moving and um, But you can see this, this is actually a model that is working pretty well, which we can tell by the fact that there's this sort of heavy shoulder to the right here. We have a lot of, a lot of voxels out in this part of the, histogram that you know don't appear on the on the left all right so this is good um, we can look at a map of where these correlations are in the brain so this is just plotting like a mosaic kind of plot um, which is not terrifically useful because we can't see where anything is 
Now we're actually going to use PyCortex. Okay, oops, so there's some things we need to tweak here. So this next line that we're going to run, this is going to plot the um, correlations uh, on a 3D cortical map. So you need to change the port here to 10,001. Um, you guys got that? Okay, so do that one. And then this guy, oh, look at that. Okay, so since I wrote this tutorial, PyCortex does a nice thing now where it actually like gives you a link. That's, that's so nice. Isn't that nice? I love that. So if you click that, I think if you click that link, it should work. I don't, I don't know what it gives you as your, your address here. If you do something weird, you should set it to localhost and see what happens. Hey, it works. Okay. So you should get something that looks kind of like this. This is the correlation values plotted on the brain. Um, the, again, the, you know, the, the white labels and the, the white outlines are showing like known ROIs. You guys gotten to this point, maybe, ish? Uh, you can hit the I key to inflate this and see down in cell sites, so you can see everything. And you can hit the F key to flatten it out and see everything at once. Uh, we can also, if we go back to hit R to go back to the original view, we can look at like a slice plane to, let's see, to see what this looks like. And we can turn off one of the hemispheres. Yeah, look at that. That's pretty cool. Look at all the voxels. These are good voxels. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. You can play around with this, whatever. You can see that the correlations are good in some places. Um, you can see where they are, actually, if you're interested in that kind of thing. So this is like uh, super rhinal gyrus, angular gyrus, TBJ kind of area. Uh, really not good right here. This is actually where we get like, drop out from the ear canals, um, drop out like, from the coronal cortex, not uh, there. Um, but hey, in like sort of higher level cortex, we get pretty good performance. Uh, nothing in lower like V1 through V4, and that's not surprising. People have their eyes closed. Nothing in like somatomotor cortex, but once you get out of the motor cortex, it goes crazy. Okay, so that's fun. Uh, let's. It looks like you're not showing negative correlations on this map, is that right? I am not. Yeah, I'm just showing a threshold of zero to two point five. If we want to do that, so we can switch this to something like. RDBU, let's do that, and then set this to minus 0 0.5 to 0.5. There we go. So now the white is zero, red is positive, and blue is negative. So I mean, there, there are going to be some negative correlations every now and then. They're mostly just kind of random schmoo. Uh, it is possible to get actually pretty large negative correlations sometimes, and that usually happens when you have some kind of non-stationary, like the, the validation set is, or the test set is like totally different from the training set for some reason. We get that with the movie data because the Test set is repeated so many times that I think it gets way more boring, and so you see weird things happening in the default mode network. But we don't see that here. The default mode network is like very well predicted in general. All right. Um, so we can also uh, use PyCortex to make a 2D map, which is what I showed you guys today. And this should work. Yeah. So we can select view like this, and that's easy to do. You can do that like in the notebook, so whatever. Um, any questions about this like model testing whatever stuff so far? Okay, cool. So there's one more thing that I want to show you guys. Um, so uh, let's actually try to do the, a little bit of this analysis that's like looking at what the voxels are actually selected for and this goes back to an earlier question. So the first thing we're going to do is we're actually going to undelay the weights. So what I mean by that is um, looking at uh, sort of separate weights for the two, four, six, and eight second delays is kind of a pain. So what I'm going to do is just average the weights across all four of those. So we get back to one 985 dimensional vector of weights per voxel. So this kind of assumes that you have essentially the same stuff happening at each delay, <clears throat> which is, I think, a pretty reasonable assumption for uh, voxels that are actually well modeled. Yeah. <clears throat> We could do that too. Um, I think this tends to be a little bit less noisy because there's just like a little bit of random variation in each one. And by averaging, you, you reduce that a little bit. That might be so I, I played with that a bit, but it didn't seem to matter that much. And the peak delay is different for Fox. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, 
Reasonable question. Um, so the, the shape of this undelayed weights, this is an absurd way to do this, but whatever, um, is 985 by 37,000. So we're back to our size of the, of the semantic word embedding space. Um, and now we can actually go back and do some stuff with the, with the word embeddings. So uh, first what we're going to do is we're going to sort the boxes by the correlation. And we're going to find this function that prints. Um, so we're going to, again, use this find words. Instead of find words like word, we're using a slightly different but related function called find words like vec that we supply a vector to. And it's going to return us the words that are most similar to that vector, Okay, or that have the highest correlation with that vector. Um, and then we're going to run this for a couple of voxels. So 0 is going to be the best voxel, 14 is the 15th best voxel, et cetera. So here's an example. This is the best voxel. This must have been the one, 20710. That's the one that I chose as like the example. Yeah, that was fine. Uh, so the, the best word is sheet. Second best is edges, <laughs> diameter, strips, cardboard. So it really seems to respond to these words. These are the words that sort of we predict this voxel would have a high response to. Um, for this other voxel, uh, it's an innocent victim, murderer, Child murder, life is guilty. <laughs> that's intense. Yeah. So uh, I think that's that's kind of it for the main tutorial. But if you want to look at this further, so we have this website right here. I don't know if you can see this. It's gallantlab.org/hooth2016. Here, this is the expanded version of that, where um, this is the mode. Uh, but this is showing data from one subject's brain. It's not the same one that's included in the tutorial data, but it's the one that I use for all the examples because it's pretty. Um, so this is our, our subject, right? And I, I even added like a, a mesh of his scalp. You can see where the brain is in the head. I thought that was fun. Uh, let's hide this guy. Now if we zoom in, we can click on a voxel, and this is doing that exact same operation that I just showed you. Uh, in fact, this uh, this voxel looks really similar. To the one that's like the best one in that. And the other sort of. um, so these are the words that are like just had the best correlation with uh, with sort of the weights for this voxel. So these are the words that our model predicts would have the highest response for this voxel. And this is showing like the model performance for this one is 0.536, which is super good. So I give it little signal bars. So it has like five signal bars, um, <laughs> and the p value is is very small. Uh, Crappy voxel, and this is 0.235 and something related. Yeah. yeah. Any questions? So for this data, was this your brain that we're looking at? Or? It's not. Does this, does this look like my head? No. It's a much more handsome face. Uh, no, this is, this is one of my old lab mates. Yeah. And that, um, the, the data that I supplied to is also not my head. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then. Um, could you, in theory, could someone give you fMRI data where they're watching a video and you could try and predict what words they're hearing? So, uh, or at least what related words? We've tried to do that. I spent at least a year of my life doing exactly that. Um, and not really yet. Uh, at least with this quality of data, this quality that we have. We're not there. We just can't do it. We can get really vague crap. Like, it's, you know, you're hearing words that are about a, it's like almost like cold reading psychic level. It's like, I'm seeing a person, I'm, I'm seeing a number, like that, that kind of thing. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, we can't get specifics yet. Uh, with a video, we can do much better. So um, uh, let me show you this. This is. Yeah, this is some data from a paper that I wrote in last year, I think. Year before, ah, uh, whatever, some year. Um, where we're doing semantic decoding with video data. Uh, this, is, this is trying to predict like what are the labels of the objects and stuff that are in this. And this works really quite well in comparison. Video gives you a hell of a lot more information. It's just higher in R2 because we have more like reps of the of the test set that's going into this. But this 
This works well. It's just language is hard. Language is like lower signal noise. Language is more variable. There's more junk going on. And uh, we need training data for that subject too. I think. So we can't just take like test data and then decode it. We need to like, have a full data set so we can train the models. Yeah. I'm wondering if, there, if you could explore whether there's structure in residuals of the predictions and whether that would inform like what parts of the video you're not capturing along with the model. Um, like what, you know, if there's particular themes that are not captured well or just, you know, in general kind of look at that. Yeah, that, that's super interesting. I, I, like, I've tried a little bit. I had a rotation student or two uh, in my whole lab who like just looked at that. Um, it's, it's really hard to just like look at this data and get anything meaningful out of it. Just like look at it and interpret it. That sucks. Like this data, it's it's so noisy. It's so noisy, right? The best the best correlation we can hope for is like 0.6 for like a really good model that fits really well. For a lot of the voxels, we're at like 0.3. What about like across four. people? Maybe the same time points in the video are not captured well by your model, and you could just say, what is the semantic content of those time points? That's reasonable. That's reasonable. Um, so we, we've done a little bit of that lately, uh, mostly because like we have a new model that works like, quite a bit better than the one that I just walked you guys through. Uh, and uh, um, and uh, so we were trying to figure out like where is it better, and so we were trying to find like time points where it's really better to look across people, and we found one. Th you know, so that that kind of it's still like hard to get at, but. Um, we found some things that kind of came out of it that made sense. Like it was points in time where people sort of stutter or like repeat themselves a bunch. This model that I just showed you guys, it kind of falls down. It screws up because it assumes that, you know, if somebody, in one of the stories, there's like the sequence where someone says like hot, 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 hot. Uh, it assumes that you know, the brain's response to hot, 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 hot is going to be exactly four times the brain's response to hot, right? Which is probably not true. Um, and so our new model, I think, accounts for, that's a sort of dumb effect that it accounts for, but it accounts for other things too, but that, that was one thing that it clearly like, came up with. Yeah, follow up. There's, I mean, you can't think of a great example, but uh, you know, two words that follow each other in one context and they have different sort of semantic in a different context, is that something that you're exploring? So that, that's our new model. Okay. Cool. It uses this like, contextual information. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned you have noise signals. <clears throat> I'm curious yeah. what they are for this. Yeah, so, um, so what we do is essentially uh, we play the story twice, right? Um, and then we can, for each voxel, you just have like time course for the first repetition, time course for the second. Uh, you can correlate those two. Uh, and that tells you more, that tells you like how much signal is there, essentially. Um, and you can use that, not exactly that correlation, but some uh, slightly modified version of that correlation uh, is a noise ceiling, which tells you sort of how good you should expect if you had exactly the right model. You know, if you had an oracle tell you like, this is the correct model for this voxel. Um, how good could you ever expect to predict something because the data is still god-awfully noisy. Uh, so there, there's a lot of methods to do this. The one that I would recommend if you're interested in this is, um, no, no, you go away. Uh, Shopic, um, do I just have this somewhere? Wait, no, no. Uh, These German names, they're the worst. No offense. Me. Uh, Oliver Schuppet, oh, crap. Let me do that. Um, this paper, Measuring Performance of Neural Models. This is a, there's a bunch of papers that came out on this in the 2000s. There was this Sahani and Linden paper, this uh, paper from uh, Anshu and Frank Tunison's lab, and there's another paper from Stephen David in Jack Hamill's lab. Um, they were all trying to do this, and it all kind of sucked. Um, they're okay. They're okay. I don't know. We, we use the the uh, Shu um, Borsten Tunison method for for my papers, but um, this this paper really like kind of pulls them all together and says like, okay, they're all actually trying to do this 
this thing and you know, we, we express it very naturally and simply. Um, I still think that this, this method is not super great. It's, it's okay. I think it, the idea of having like a noise ceiling as like a number, it's like this is how good the correlation should be. Um, this is bogus. <laughs> like that's, uh, this is usually like a point estimate of something that you should not use as a point estimate because it's relatively frequent that you can get actually correlations, uh, sort of correlations that are higher than your noise ceiling. So you get like corrected correlations that are above one, which is ridiculous. So I think that some more uh, detailed like Bayesian approach where you look at like, this is the distribution of correlations that you would expect to see you know, under this noise model. Um, and then, you know, where, where does your actual correlation fall in that distribution? Something like that would be, would be more interesting, more meaningful, but that doesn't exist. Or at least it's just a thing yet. So I know Lab, they like to keep everything in native space and never align to like the common space. But there is could potentially be a benefit of at least uh, doing like hyper alignment training because you can get so much more data if you use you know instead of having one person do something for two hundred hours, you could get you know two hundred people do something for one hour. So you can bring up all the data sets that people have for videos. I, it, you lose some because you had to obviously align it, but at least you'll have 200 of these data sets yeah. to train on. I'm, I'm working on exactly that thing with one of my students right now. We're trying to do this where like, instead of collecting all the data for every subject, just like throw out some of those data, or you know, don't collect everything, collect like some selected data sets for each subject. Use something like hyper alignment to like interpolate the data across people and then train on that, and you can do way better on that than just using like the data. It's still worse than using like all the data, but it's much cheaper. Right? So 100% you can do that. Uh, I think hyper alignment that we're using, which is like the shared plot model, is um, isn't a, it's a totally different thing from like aligning to a common space, right? So it's a totally different thing from anatomical alignment. Uh, it makes no assumptions about you know one-to-one -one anatomical correspondence like you do if you're doing you know aligning to an eye space or whatever, um, and I think that that's much more reasonable. So I'm like, totally on board with that, and there are people in Jack's lab working on things like this too, but using like a, a autoencoder kind of neural network approaches. But I, I think, and, and uh, canonical correlation analysis too. Um, but I think these like sort of non-anatomical uh, alignment of subjects, that, that makes perfect sense, and I Anyone else? All right. Sweet. So um, I guess just to let me close down here. Uh, you go away. You go away. All right. Um, that was it for this tutorial. Uh, you're welcome to like play with this, whatever. Do do what you want. Um, uh, there's a little thing here that shows you like if you wanted to do a phoneme model and test that, you can, there's some simple code for doing that here. Um, yeah, I don't know. Have at it. Have fun. Thanks, guys.